300 feet. Well, incrementally they change that, and now in some areas it can go f way farther back and encompass somebody's property. Watershed. I mean, this is happening all yeah. over. In Errol, if you're familiar with Errol, mm -hmm. a huge federal land grab. The environmentals came in and they're trying to expand that, um, that sanctuary up there far beyond what the citizens want. So 700 people got together and petitioned the legislature mm -hmm. to step in and stop these people from doing that. It's, it's getting out of hand with the, with the feds getting involved with fishing game and the U.S. Wildlife Service to control our private property by using grant money and, and everything else that I'm talking too much about. <laughs> so we want to know how you're going to stop that. Uh, I'm going to wait for this SB 217 huh? to come over. <laughs> come on, hey, you got to have a better than that, you know. Dino. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, Tom, too. Just one thing I know, it's, it's a little bit on the federal level, like overriding our state government. <coughs> you know, like we have some of the really strictest, you know, wetlands <laughs> protection, and they just went through in over the last four years since, you know, Benson and uh, a few of the other ones overhauled the, the, the BES. <laughs> yeah, the B they, they did a great job, I think, with the DES making it still some good laws and but you know taking some of the uh, really um, over-the-top laws out of it so now since then they've gone now over the top again since the Democrats have been in everybody's been able to get their laws passed and everything and have made the alteration of terrain permit which they've changed from the the um, the old site specific permit now it's an alteration of terrain Permit, but it's still at 100,000 square feet. If you disturb more than 100,000 square feet of area on your land, you need this permit. It's 50 now. It is 50,000 square feet now. All right, so it could be 50,000. It is. I, last I knew it was 100,000. <coughs> it's, it's 50. Okay, so, but it gets back to, you know, knowing, knowing the rules and not knowing the rules somewhat. But right now, the state, I mean, the government, the federal government, EPA, if you disturb more than an acre, 43,000 square feet, you have to have a special permit, an AUI permit from the government to disturb an acre. So forget about the state. State rules are even a little less than the government rules. And now they just mandated, I don't know how they did it, because the state, I guess, is happy with it. But they, we have to, any water leaving, if you get that permit, leaving your land, you have to test to see if it has anything in it. Any chemicals, any, uh, you know, turbidity in it, any dirt in it, anything like that. So, I mean, it's all part of this thing, I'm sure, that whether well, money's funding it, but I just think it's people getting together and saying we need more environmental control because there's some bad people out there wrecking our water. You know, it's not like before that, okay, we had tanneries on the rivers and everything else polluting our rivers and people throwing everything in the rigid rivers. It's all about education, but instead of educating people and trying to get people to do the right thing, they go and put these laws in, and now it, it just seems like it's bypassing the state and coming right, I could get fined tomorrow for, uh, for disturbing over 50,000 square feet, uh, because I thought it was 100, I'd probably disturb over 50,000 on my land. Uh, but I've been keeping it under 100,000 square feet, waiting for it to get established before I could do a little bit more. All I'm doing is putting a driveway in seven tenths of a mile for my <coughs> of my house, and I can't do it legally. It sounds like, and I know I can't do it legally from the EPA standpoint because um, I know I'm basically breaking the law there because I don't have an AUI permit. So how are you going to fix that? If if you look at the history, <laughs> with the fix, with Charlie. It. Where the Clean Water Act happened in, in 74 and the best management practices that were adopted then, people at that point had learned from the history what mismanagement was doing to the environment. But now, now today, in our environment, now there's bureaucrats and government positions that advocate um, all of the good things and then over-exaggerate the problems. And they create a fear and the need for remedy because of that fear and they've got a job mm -hmm. and their job is in that department or that bureaucracy and they like keeping that job so the more fear uh, there's there's a few people with a lot of answers um, a few people with some answers that twist 
those uh, situations, problems, and and uh, solutions. And a lot of people that don't know a whole lot of uh, the, the topic, the ones that know something are talking about, the people that have less information because what they hear make them fear what's going to happen if they don't act in the direction of the bureaucrats and, and that new division or department. I think it's just we're paying a whole lot of taxes to support the bureaucrats that have jobs that create um, an idea in the general public that it's good to have these bureaucracies and the people in those jobs. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that there was a, I, I helped sponsor a bill that was going to abolish shoreland protection entirely and it went too far so the Senate said we're not going to abolish it we're going to keep the good things and try to make the permits easier okay so I know that you've dealt with it a lot before you've dealt with shoreland protection too uh, and I know you have too Charlie my understanding is the permits are supposed to be quicker <coughs> and easier they're supposed to be a little more user friendly and I hope that's taken place but yeah. it was a while there it was very difficult to do so I think it's little steps like that that these laws come and they might revamp and your state reps kind of help out with the Senate to kind of back off these regulations <coughs> until it gets to the point where it needs to be where the environment's protected but yet it still can be permitted and the use can be had you know on a, on a, on a level basis it yeah. sounds like they've overreached from what if, you guys if are they saying. look at the end result and they realize right. that the Clean Water Act had goals in mind if the best management practices that are utilized attain those goals that's what they need to be concerned with, not each and every, you know, I mean, I, I'm not advocating no silt fence or anything like that, but there's a lot of situations where silt fence actually creates more problems than it does solve problems. Go ahead, Ken. I think on the, um, just to bring you guys back to what Dino can do, not to speak for Dino, but I think as a general rule, when we look at what's out there, that comes in the form of uh, this is good for you and there's a grant behind it. Sometimes the grants that we take on, sometimes we'll spend a million dollars chasing $400,000 and to implement it. And, there's, and I think that um, if we just push back from kind of the federal push on the grants and kind of look at those twice before we say yes, mm -hmm. which I think, I think you have a representative that does that. I think you have two that do that. I think everything that we're talking about, these guys are on, are on that stuff. But it has gone too far. Um, you know, I think for the, if you look at our own town, well, you look at a couple of things. Under the current situation, they never could have built Disneyland, that's for sure. But they also couldn't have built Blue Lake. All right. They couldn't have built Northeast that, Pond. They couldn't have done things that are historic for our area. We can't do the things that were monumental just 40, 50 years ago. And so if we're going to get business and we're going to get industry and we're going to get people to build an affordable house, we've got to back off on some of these things. So you have to push back on the international treaties. You have to push back on the federal grants that do us all good. And I think we have those guys here. I think Joe and Dino do exactly what we're all talking about. I think what we've all been doing tonight is kind of preaching to the choir. Uh, but, but you know, the question is, we got to get how does Dino get the rest of the 400 and some odd people to his side? Great segue for what I was just about to say. Thank you very much. It, it is one thing to have a, a couple of reps down there, and it's soon to, get to be three. Wakefield will have three reps um, because we're going to, if redistricting goes through, we're going to engulf Ossipi into our three towns already. Um, but I can't tell you, especially with the wealth of knowledge that's in this room tonight, can't tell you how important it is to go and <coughs> testify before committees. Absolutely. I, I, I know you have, Chief. I know you have. Has anyone else gone? I, I know you have. I did in uh, 88. There you go, but you still did it. And i got to tell you, sitting on a committee and having the people come and testify, it's one of the purest forms of government yeah. because we truly do listen. We do listen. And if people come in with great points, educated points, um, we really listen to that. And that's where it all happens is inside of that committee, uh, committee room. Now, with that said, 
the next step is, I mean, there's, isn't anybody on this in, in this room tonight that probably hasn't been on a board in a local town? I mean, look how many are here now that sit on a board or have sat on a board. That's where the other part of it takes place, is if you can sit on these boards and have an effect, if you can sit on a planning board and know that Agenda 21, when that thing pops up, you can read it and read between the lines, that's your first line of defense. And I think it's important that the folks that are against Agenda 21 or things like it get to the selectmen and get to these towns and, and keep doing what you're doing because I can tell you when this stuff comes up down at the State House, it's kind of laughed at. It's kind of pushed aside. There's a lot of things that come in that have to do with the UN and a rep will look at that and go, well, we got nothing to do with the UN and they'll vote against it. But they don't understand the circumstances of what's happening coming through the back door. So that's kind of a long-winded way to say that you guys can get involved, you should get involved, because it, it does work. In this state, you know, it does work. Absolutely. I can tell you, and this, and Ed knows, that he filmed it, HB 1402. <coughs> Got a group together, we call them the Micro Farmers of New Hampshire. Loyally local. We put a logo together, organize people to go up to make it legal, to consume, to sell from the farm, raw milk, raw cheese, raw butter, and so forth and so on. This was the poster child for involvement in government. In fact, a bipartisan committee even was so surprised how well this worked, going through the House, going through the Senate, even the Department of Health and Human Services that handles that you know, raw milk and farm products, whatever. They totally backed off. They had sent out cease and desist orders. They just stopped right in their tracks. Re re rescinded the orders. And this thing flew through because there was so much participation on the local level. People who were farmers in Wolfboro and around here came in their farm clothes. You know, some of them brought raw cheese. We had representatives come and eat the raw cheese, drink raw milk, and so forth and so on. It went through, but it was the poster child for how to do this. And by the way, for anybody who wants help organizing that, I would be glad to help. I've done it for 20 years, helping people out there. What a joy it is to see people participate in the government and know how it works. Because it's very frustrating, isn't it? Yeah. Especially as people get up there. I mean, just finding a parking space in Concord is hard enough. I've paid more parking tickets for the city of Concord than have to send them to Manchester. It's just the cost of doing business, but it is great. And it helps the representatives and men like Dino can have effect on our state, our, our U.S. senators and our congressmen. And do you know before the 17th Amendment, it was our state legislature that elected our senators to go and represent the state government. Not a populist election, but to, to represent the state government. I voted to repeal the 17th Amendment. We didn't get much traction, but that will come back to That's huge. You've got to repeal yeah, the 16th huge. first. Why? Because it, it comes before the 17th? Well, no, because it has to do with your income taxes. Oh, but, but I just told you at the beginning of the night, we're not going to have an income tax here if you vote for it in November. I'm vote for that about, amendment. I'm talking federal. Oh, all Let's right. go big for a, just a second. another <laughs> CACR. <laughs> forgive me for forgetting the number, but we... We, uh, Dan Insa, uh, Greg Sorg, Paul Ingbertson, uh, Paul Mursky, mm -hmm. been going around speaking. I've been there, Master of Ceremonies. We spoke at St. Anselm about reining in an overactive judiciary. Good bill. Yeah. Dean Olfax? Yes, Al. I have one thing I wanted to get back to. You said it a long time ago about the gambling yeah. being defeated yeah. here. Yeah. What is the matter with this state? Do they think we still milk cows by hand? <laughs> I don't think they still think that. Al, I honestly... Well, I do, because I'll tell you, no. I used to go to Foxwoods yeah. three times a month. Holy moly. And I know buses out of here, and you do too. Yeah. They're going out almost every day of the week. Where are they going? They're going to Sparkwoods, Mohegan Sun, Atlantic City, and wherever. Well, what is wrong with this state? If they had started the Foxwoods, our taxes would be zippo. I was, a, I was against it three years ago. 
Al, and now I'm, I'm with you on that, and I think a perfect place would be Peas. Peas Air Base would be perfect. Would be perfect for it, and I because don't. Because you have these high rollers yeah. with their Learjets and the that whole That fly in and the They'll whole thing. fly yeah. right in there. Al, to be honest with you, I don't know what the reason is. It gets soundly defeated every time it comes up. I don't know if it's because of a lobbying group behind it. Or if the if the reps down there just feel that it's going to be a change of life for New Hampshire, they I, I think don't know we're what going to get you. a bunch of crime. You already have it. Yeah, it gets it gets. Maine is going to be ahead of us pretty soon. They already have one casino and they're building another one. Yeah. And Massachusetts is talking about building one. Another good one would be uh, the Balsam. <coughs> be a good place. Yes. I just want to get back. Uh, I, I think the Balsam would be an awful place, right? and, the, and the reason why the people up there are poor enough as it is. If we start bringing that stuff in there, they, they, they're going to be extremely poor. And, and, <laughs> and I'm up there. Yeah. I, I, I go there all the time, and you know, and I really would think, and and I and I understand. I believe in gambling. I don't have a problem with gambling. But to, to say maybe the Balsam, that would surely take the character out of the North Country. And I, you know, and I believe, believe me, I think gambling would get us out of crisis by by money. But to put it there, Pease is a much better location. But you to put it at the Balsams, you uh, or in the, and I and I agree. But I so go there for the sanctuary the of of where it is, mm -hmm. and to go up there and see a, a bunch of people and taxis riding down the street and buses yeah. coming in constantly. Uh, that's, Holy, that, that's right. a good point. I'll just say this about gambling, and we'll get to Dave because we're kind of off topic. <laughs> yeah. I think the last thing I'll say about gambling is, if it didn't pass three years ago when we had almost a billion dollar deficit, and now that we're balanced and we've kind of back on track. I don't know if it has much strength right now. I don't care. I know where I'm going. We're going to Foxwood. <laughs> That's right. Dave. I just want to put in a plug. We, uh, we passed over the, uh, the topic of shoreland regulations. Uh, Awa and the Wakefield Conservation Commission are co-sponsoring a workshop on uh, Saturday the 23rd of June at 9 o'clock in the morning and we're going to have free food but it's addressed to uh, shoreland owners, people who work in shoreland, people who are interested in shoreland. What we're going to try to do, we have experts coming from the state, uh, DES, uh, lakes associations and so forth, uh, including our local code enforcement officer. We're going to talk about what you have to do in the way of best practices and what you have to do in the way of regulations if you want to do anything on the shorefront to try to take some of the mystery out of it. So there'll be answers by the people who have the answers for anyone who comes with questions. Mm -hmm. Education. Okay. It's going to be about educa yeah. edu educating the people. Not, outreach. Not, it's not going to be a forum to get people together to try to make more regulations. It's going to get take the regulations that we have and help educate people. And if they're educated on it and they think they're too restrictive, then they could get a group together to, to break them down and take them to the government and change them. It will but on a local level, it, it's a great thing, and I think we have two really great local boards. Yeah, we have actually three conservation members here tonight, but the, the point is that we don't want to encourage people to do things simply because they can. We want them to encourage people what the best practices, what is the best for the lake. I'm sure all the lakefront owners want to preserve the lake. So it's going to be about 50% what you should do and about 50% of how to do it in terms of this regulation structure. There'll be a small time to suggest any <coughs> changes that people think for the shoreland. Well, I would just I would just like to finish up because I think we're closing up. I would like to just reiterate with the, with the knowledge and wisdom that we do have in this room, whether it's with the construction guys or the liberty guys, constitution, planning board, the gun rights and the hunting, um, and law enforcement. The gambling. The, the gambling, right? <laughs> the gamblers. I can't emphasize it enough. If you see bills that are coming up in the future, a year or two, uh, if you can take the time to get down there, uh, I know it's a lot to take a day off of work and go down to Concord and, and sit in those rooms, but um, it really is the purest form that we have of government, and it really does work because yes. we can't. I can't speak like a like a Tom Doobie or an Al Marinin or, or, or <laughs> Ken Fifield. I I don't have that background or that knowledge. And when we hear that testimony, we do take notes and we really do look at it seriously. So if you see bills that you're against or for, please recommend that you you do that. Make it down there. Okay. So thank you all very much. Thank for you. Having thank me. you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.